Prison Reform Obama was the first U.S. president to visit a federal prison and sit with men inside. He led a historic clemency effort that freed nearly 2,000 people who had been in federal prison for drug-related offenses. And he issued executive orders to address various aspects of the criminal and prison justice system. Yet, Obama was unable to get a comprehensive piece of criminal justice legislation through Congress. There have been a lot of interesting bills, unfortunately only half are making it to the House or Senate. For the first time in history, at the 2016 Democratic and Republican conventions, both political parties adopted language that called for reform of the prison and criminal justice systems. The administrations prior were hostile to a broad overhaul but for a decade now, both conservatives and liberals have embraced reforms. In the final months of the Obama administration, the Justice Department announced a new approach to preparing prisoners for life beyond bars. Officials created a prison school system, pledged money for technology training, and promised to help prevent former inmates from returning to prison. However immediately after taking office, the Trump administration officials began undoing their work. Budgets were slashed, the school system was scrapped and studies were shelved. And a year and a half later, the White House declared that improving prisoner education and reducing recidivism was a top priority. The Trump administration appeared serious about its proposals, and during the Trump era, chances for bipartisan reform of the criminal justice system seemed unlikely. But to the surprise of many, some much-needed modest changes did occur. Even though the Prison Reform and Redemption Act expanded earned time credit opportunities to include any program proved to reduce recidivism. By allowing incarcerated men and women to reunite with their families sooner and create a smoother and safer re-entry transition. We need more from prison reform. The millions of human beings who remain trapped within the discriminatory and dysfunctional justice system deserve more. The harmful rhetoric that has often stigmatized immigrants and people of color as criminals, needs a broader overhaul. Many legislators have much to say on the prison reform controversial topic, the pathway moving forward does show both parties are susceptible to more progress. Leaders on both sides of the aisle need to continue working together to win possible progress. At the state and local levels, the nationwide momentum to fix the justice system isn't stalling any longer. The push for federal prison reform is also a matter of justice, not to mention human dignity. Taking a small but meaningful step together now could allow us to take more steps together later. Street Game Mentality and Code of Honor The mentality itself originated from slave owners during the 1700s. Slave owners back in the day believed that once they had bought a slave at whatever cost, the slave was a symbol of their honor. Since then people who have been well impacted by slavery, use this mentality to experience the strength that people of slavery weren't able to. The issue is people who think this way, also raise their kids to think this way. In the hood and other gang turf areas, people and kids young as 10 are lured into playing the street game, and some of them are illiterate. Whatever path you choose whether basketball, gang member, hip-hop, prostitution or stripping, rap or even selling drugs, the mentality is death before dishonor. This means you are governed by street game morals and principles, and the consequence of breaking rules to the game means you can get killed. The people who are lured, are schooled, and then turned out into playing the street game for the honor. Addiction to alcohol and drugs usually keeps the person from wanting to get out. People who play the game right are considered good players, in the street game good players do bad things. And generally, destruction and violence come with the street game mentality, a player could die. Many of the street game players see killings by gangs and don't report the crimes to local authorities for fear of being killed too. The person that does report is called a rat or snitch. Often, the people who have supported the street game for years, never make it out the hood or other gang turfs. In turn, this makes them more susceptible to destruction, violence, and street game morals. Even though many die for gang turf, to them it is more about the street game hustle itself. Either police officials apprehend the criminals, or they die playing the street game. Very few become successful people from a criminal standpoint. If the criminals are convicted and sentenced, he or she are then lured into same-sex gender relations within the prison system. This often leads to the mass destruction of personal identity, something all criminals face. Marriage is ruled out for open relationships. Fathers and mothers are away from their kids, and the cycle then repeats itself. When those family members ought to be honoring long-term relationships, and family values. The crime wars that go on in the world, have always been about who's partially right over what is consistently fair. Rather than building a strong foundation for families and friends. These are too many reasons why this generation has more people with personality disorders. But some people believe that dogmatic nature is what makes people want to commit crimes, and others believe it is the eternal forces of the past. Either way, becoming a convict isn't something to look forward to, and the criminal's action of interest has to be resolved with some form of discipline. Not having role models in these family structures are a signal of awareness with them slowly diminishing. Sure, states are doing what they can with given resources, and even with the country in debt. Yet, Americans who leave prison after paying a debt to society are still finding reoccurring punishments for their past mistakes. 
with necessities such as a driver's license, jobs, housing, voting rights, etc. Some incarcerated juveniles can't even find jobs or housing once they are released. While they do acquire a GED and some technical education, some on-the-job training may break the cycles of crime. According to the word in the street, and the recidivism statistics inmates have as much access to illegal drugs, in jails and prisons as they do in the streets. Using drugs before, during, and after incarceration wouldn't make someone feel there is an urgency to change long term. And this may be a link to why illiteracy still seems to form major problems with repeat offenders. I am a firm believer in second chances, as long as the person doesn't consider the second chance a complete failure beforehand. Criminals wear the code of honor in the streets, just as they do when convicted of a crime. However, the subordinate code of ethics generally does have a consistent ad of demands, since we are an unforgiving society. Some people still speculate whether giving federal inmates a fresh start would be considered as a forgiving path back into society. And this very well may be linked to the mass of police shootings all across the nation. It appears that criminals aren't willing to change and society isn't forgiving as everyone pretends. And, if you are a criminal that doesn't want to conform to the laws of the land semantics, you will become a part of the recidivism statistics of inmates. Criminals ought to be able to catch up with the fast and growing pace economy once they are released, without having to commit crimes to get by. But with the unforeseen reoccurring punishments steadily mounting, increasing the types of literacy for criminals needs to happen. Since the street game becomes embedded in their everyday life of thinking. Changing the thought process will require more advanced thinking, to not be lured into the street game again. Because it is about repairing the person's identity, personality, perceptions, and reputation long term with respect for self and others' rights and responsibilities. Cognitive education and treatment ought to be assigned to criminals before, during, and after incarceration to help them better understand how the mind functions, and why there is an urgency to change long term. Mental health alone doesn't cover the cognitive dissonance in overworked facilities, enough to make the person want to become responsible for their accountability. Creating support for criminals. As an unforgiving country, the US ought to be finding ways to give criminals freedom while locked up. It is time our country takes a new direction in prison reform by combining both men and women. Being incarcerated shouldn't include more setbacks. One great element of creation involves the entire human race being able to produce children and families. This would encourage family-originated structures, rather than single men having sex in prison with the same gender and vice versa for females. Criminals aren't kids, and so they ought not to be treated as children. The words prison reform could take on a whole new meaning, by acknowledging that criminals are two people instead of animals.